This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then you can replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the anatomy of the arm and forearm. Identify the muscle A. What is the nerve supply? Which bones provide the distal attachment of the muscle? This is a deep dissection of the flexor compartment of the forearm showing the deep layer muscles. Note that the superficial muscles are reflected backwards toward the common origin from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The intermediate layer represented by flexor digitorum superficialis is also reflected medially. Thus, because of this reflection, the deep muscle is exposed. The muscle in question is located on the medial side of the flexor compartment of the forearm and it is the flexor digitorum profundus. Profundus means deep. Note that it is the bulkiest muscle of the forearm. It arises from the ulna and the interosseous membrane and distally it splits into four tendons. The tendons pass under the flexor retinaculum which is not shown here and the tendons are inserted into the distal phalanges of the medial four digits thus acting on the distal interphalangeal joint. Flexor digitorum superficialis, which is attached to the middle phalanges of the medial four digits, does not act on the distal interphalangeal joint. The muscle is supplied by two nerves. The medial part is supplied by the ulnar nerve together with the flexor carpi ulnaris. These are the one and a half muscles supplied by the ulnar nerve in the forearm. The lateral part of the muscle is supplied like all other muscles of the flexor compartment of the forearm. It is supplied by the median nerve. Here, the lateral part of flexor digitorum profundus is specifically supplied by the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve. This anterior interosseous nerve lies in front of the interosseous membrane between the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor pollicis longus which you can see it here as the unipinnate muscle, supplying both, and it also supplies the distally lying pronator quadratus muscle. Now let's sort out the neurovascular structures. This is the radial nerve lying lateral to the tendon of biceps. You can see that it divides into a deep branch and a superficial branch, the cutaneous branch. And here's the brachial artery lying medial to biceps and divides into a radial and ulnar arteries. This is the median nerve, again lying medial to biceps tendon, but here it is being pulled medially, retracted. Otherwise, it will go straight through the middle of the forearm to reach the front of the wrist. Here's the ulnar nerve lying behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus and then reappearing here in the flexor compartment of the forearm just deep to flexor carpi ulnaris. Again, I repeat, this is not the usual location of the median nerve. It is just being retracted away from the middle of the arm to clearly show the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. So don't be confused. Identify the muscles A and B. Be specific. This is a dissection of the extensor compartment of the arm. The muscle is triceps which as its name indicates has three heads of origin, long, lateral, and medial. The long head arises from the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula outside the capsule of the shoulder joint. The lateral head arises from the posterior surface of the humerus, superior and lateral to the radial groove. You can see the radial groove here occupied by the radial nerve and profunda brachii artery. The third head is the medial head that is attached to the posterior surface of the humerus, inferior and medial to the radial group. It is not clearly shown because it is overlaid by the superficial part of the muscle. It might help here to understand the relations of the heads to consider a superficial part of the muscle formed by the long and lateral heads that lie side by side and 
In this way, they are comparable to biceps and the flexor compartment. The medial head is the deep part of the muscle, located in a deeper plane, and is comparable to brachialis, that is, the deep muscle and the flexor compartment of the arm. Which combination of two muscles would become weak when the radial nerve is injured in the axilla? Let's first identify the muscles. This is a lateral view showing anteriorly the biceps muscle 2 and the brachialis muscle. Both are located in the flexor compartment of the arm. Brachialis is deeper to biceps muscle. Here on the lateral side is a muscle extending from the humerus crossing the elbow. From the lateral side of the humerus it is the brachioradialis muscle. One is the deltoid muscle, and here we can see the posterior fibers of deltoid. This is the shape of the deltoid as we look at it from the lateral side, and this is as we look at it from the posterior side. And four is the triceps muscle. You can see here that only two heads of triceps are seen. The long head of triceps arising from the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula, and the lateral head of triceps. The medial head of triceps is located in a deeper plane. Of the muscles here that are supplied by the radial nerve, it is the triceps muscle, and this is supplied by branches of the radial nerve as it lies in the axilla and in the spiral groove. And the other muscle is the brachioradialis muscle 5. You can see here that the radial nerve arises again in the anterior compartment it is located between brachialis and brachioradialis and it supplies brachioradialis here so the two muscles that might become weak when the radial nerve is injured in the axilla are triceps 4 and brachioradialis 5 identify the muscle a what is its action on the wrist this is the most medial of the muscles of the extensor compartment of the forearm. Note that it arises from the common extensor tendon at the lateral humeral epicondyle. However, it has an additional aponeurotic origin from the subcutaneous border of the ulna. Follow the muscle distally. It passes deep to the extensor retinaculum and is inserted into the metacarpal bones. This is the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle and it is inserted into the base of the fifth metacarpal bone. It is comparable to its flexor counterpart, flexor carpi ulnaris. However, the insertion of flexor carpi ulnaris is through a ligament extending between the pisiform and the fifth metacarpal, called pisometacarpal ligament. The subcutaneous border of the ulna from which part of the muscle is attached also provides origin for the flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. So this subcutaneous border of the ulna can be considered as a border between flexors and extensors of the forearm. If you start from the subcutaneous border and travel anteriorly, you will find the flexor carpi ulnaris and then palmaris longus and flexor carpi radialis and the other muscles of the flexor compartment. And if you travel posteriorly, then you will meet the extensor carpi ulnaris and extensor digiti minimi, extensor digitorum, and so on. Extensor carpi ulnaris arises from the lateral epicondyle, common extensor origin, proximal to the elbow, thus it is a weak extensor of the elbow. But its most important action is on the wrist. Being attached to the fifth metacarpal bone, it extends the wrist. And crossing the medial side of the wrist, it also adducts the wrist. So it extends and adducts the wrist. Acting together with carpal extensors, extensor carpi radialis, longus and brevis, it produces extension of the wrist because the adduction component of flexor carpi ulnaris will be cancelled by the wrist abduction component of both extensor carpi radialis, longus and brevis. When the ulnar carpals work together, that's to say flexor carpi ulnaris and extensor carpi ulnaris, then flexion will cancel out extension and only adduction of the wrist remains. Identify the nerve A and fibrous sheath B. This is a deep dissection of the flexor compartment of the arm, showing the biceps brachii being cut proximal to its tendon of insertion 
and reflected laterally, note that the tendon of biceps at the roof of the cubital fossa has an extension called bicipital aponeurosis. This is a thin sheet of connective tissue that passes medially to blend with the deep fascia of the forearm. An aponeurosis means a wide flat tendon. Follow the nerve A proximally. Note that in the axilla it arises from the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus. It is the median nerve. Follow it distally and note that it enters the cubital fossa medial to the tendon of biceps muscle. Also note the ulnar nerve arising from the medial cord of the brachial plexus in the axilla. Here it is present in the arm, first in the flexor and then in the extensor compartment of the arm reaching behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Note that it is accompanied by a branch of the brachial artery, the superior ulnar collateral artery, which accompanies the ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It participates in the anastomosis around the elbow joint. Identify the joints A to D, what is the type and variety of each. All are synovial joints. A is the joint between the head of the radius and the capitulum of the humerus. It is the humeroradial joint, part of the elbow joint, which is a hinge type of synovial joint. B is the joint between the circumference of the head of the radius and the radial notch of the ulna. It is the proximal radioulnar joint. It's a pivot type of synovial joint, allowing rotation together with the distal radioulnar joint D. Rotation here takes place during pronation and supination. So D is another pivot joint between the head of the ulna. Note that the head of the ulna is located distally while the head of the radius is located proximally. So this is the head of the ulna. This is the styloid process of the ulna. The head of the ulna articulates with an ulnar notch of the radius at the distal radio ulnar joint. This joint is separated from the capsule of the wrist joint while the proximal radio ulnar joint is continuous with the capsule of the elbow joint. C is the wrist joint. The wrist joint is a condyloid type of synovial joint. It allows flexion and extension as well as adduction and abduction or what we call it ulnar deviation for adduction and radial deviation for abduction. And of course, a combination of these movements is called circumduction. Circumduction is not rotation. It's a combination of flexion, abduction, extension, and adduction. The joint is formed between the proximal row of carpal bones, except the pisiform. These bones articulate with the distal end of the radius and with the triangular ligament located at the distal end of the ulna. So the ulna does not participate in the formation of the wrist joint. There is a triangular ligament here separating the ulna from the proximal row of carpal bones, but the ulna forms the elbow joint. That's why forces are transmitted from the hand directly into the radius, and then from the radius they are transmitted by the interosseous membrane lying between the two bones to the ulna to be transmitted from the proximal part of the ulna to the humerus.